friend, welcome back to Graceville Grit. I am so glad you're joining us today for another chat about families and motherhood. As of this recording, we are on the very back end of summer and looking towards the school year again. Our guest today is Brooke McLaughlin, the co-founder of Million Praying Moms and author of seven books, including her latest, Everyday Prayers for Patients, Giving Yourself and Your Kids the Grace to Grow. She's a wife and mom to two teenage boys who make their home in the mountains of Appalachia, calling Southwestern Virginia home. Welcome, Brooke. I'm so glad to have you join us. For our friends here online that don't know you, can you tell them a little bit about yourself and your family? Yeah, absolutely, Lana. Thank you so much for having me. I love the name of this podcast. I think it's super fun and I, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Well, I am from uh, Virginia, from the mountains of Virginia. I live in the Blue Ridge Mountains. We come from a one, little one stoplight town and I, I grew up in this town. I moved away for 20 some years and then my husband and I moved back intentionally to be a little bit closer to family and our aging parents. And so uh, we're back home, so to speak, in this tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, but we love it. We love the rich cultural history of this part of the world and um, just, you know, it, it's really had a positive impact on our kids and our kids are, um, you know, very involved in sports and they're very involved in uh, the, the culture of the area, which for us translates as music. Both of our kids play the fiddle. And um, and so it's been a fun upbringing for them to be able to run all over this one stoplight town. And, and you know, I almost feel like I can be one of those moms of old that can whistle for them when it's dinner time. Mm -hmm. And that's not oh. something we would have been able to give them in a larger area. So we're really happy about that. I've been married to my husband, Corey, for 21 years this summer. And um, my kids are 18 and 16. I just graduated the oldest. Praise the Lord. We survived <laughs> that. Um, but <laughs> it had ups and downs, but it was good. And uh, he's getting ready to go off to college. And, um, and then I have a 16 year old who's getting ready to be a sophomore in high school. So we've, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. I have the privilege of running a ministry, like you said, called Million Praying Moms. And um, I get to share what God has taught me about prayer being uh, not a last resort, like many of us see it, but as the first and best response to the challenges we face in this world. And so I'm just spending all my time trying to get people to look at it a little differently than they ever have and run toward prayer instead of saving it for the very last thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so good. And, you know, God bless boy moms. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> yes. I have three boys and they, it's just a whole different thing. I, my fourth is a girl and uh, it, it, it's different. I don't care what anyone says. It's, mm -hmm. it's definitely um, unique and they need your prayers, especially like you said, um, and I didn't realize they were musicians too. I knew they were sports and all of my kiddos were heavy on the sport, you know, three sport athletes and morning practices, evening practices, all the mm -hmm. things. And it just adds a new dynamic when you bring in um, there's so many positives to being a sports mom and having kids oh, there like are. That, with all the, um, the things that you learn and how to deal with other people and the ups and the downs and how to be a good loser as well as a good winner. Mm -hmm. I love all that. Uh, but there's also that, that whole thing with, um, coaches and other parents on the team. There's just, it's an added dimension to parenthood. And I just love that, uh, you say that praying is is kind of the foundation of all that as it should be. So I would love to hear a little bit more about your organization and why you started that and kind of like what what is your structure, what is your mission, all of that type of thing. It's I find it very fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I should be honest and tell you that when I first started in ministry, um, I, I was ministering to mothers of boys. We, uh, a business partner, ministry partner, and I ran a website called the Mob Society. Mob stood for mothers of boys. There was no no bloodshed oh, or any, that. anything like that. But that's that's what we did. We had five boys between us, and we felt like in that season that there was a shortage of great information out there for moms who were trying to raise godly men, which is very much what we wanted to do. And mm -hmm. so, because we were young, because our boys were were very young when we started that, we surrounded ourselves with moms who were further ahead in the journey and said, 
let's all share this together. And, and I don't know that we realized how much that need was there because it just kind of blew up and exploded. But from the, from the very beginning, prayer was the foundation of everything we did there. And for a few years, we had been doing ministry for probably 10 years or so. We had started producing prayer journals for mothers of boys. My first book was called Praying for Boys, which ironically is still my bestseller. It's still my mm-hmm. number one bestseller. And mm-hmm. so um, it was, you know, prayer was at, was, was a heartbeat of what we did there, even though the ministry itself was not about prayer. Um, but in about 2017, 2018, my business partner then, uh, she has since moved on to some other great things. She does a lot of local ministry now, but she and I both began to feel this call to go deeper into prayer. And so in 2019, Mm -hmm. we finally said yes to the Lord over that and Million Praying Moms was born. And so again, the, the, the mission of Million Praying Moms is to help moms make prayer their first and best response to the challenges of motherhood. That's my mission. That's my mm-hmm. bullseye. Everything I do in ministry gets measured up against that. Am I helping you do that? Am I helping you make uh, g- give prayer a place of priority, greater and greater priority in your life? And the reason that I'm so passionate about that is because of what that kind of vibrant prayer life has done in me and in mm-hmm. my family. So, um, when I was a very goal oriented person growing, I always have been, I was a, mm-hmm. a good student. I was toward the top of my class. Um, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do in life. And by the time I had both of our boys who, by the way, both, both they were born 23 months apart they were both very wanted, but neither one of them were planned. We did not do that on purpose to, to have them that close together. It's just what God did. And uh, by the time we had our first son, when I was 27, I had pretty much checked off every major goal I had for my life, including that I'd asked God to give me boys. Mm-hmm. I wanted to have boys. I have an older brother. My dad was one of three boys. My husband is one of three boys. I really wanted the opportunity to try and raise godly men. It's, it's just something that God had put on my heart. I was very naive about it in the beginning. And when I had those two boys so close together, uh, the Lord used that to kick my feet out from under me. I look at, I look back at that now. And I know that it was for the best, uh, because I needed to learn to depend on him instead mm-hmm. of myself. And so mm-hmm. I very quickly realized that all those ways that I'd been able to achieve my goals in the past, that there was no man handling my boys into loving Jesus mm-hmm. or obeying me or having perfect behavior. There was none of that. Like, you know, we as parents have to learn to, I mean, there is some amount of of needing to control our children, right? But I couldn't control their hearts. And I remember one day um, I was reading in the book of Ezekiel, and I wish I could tell you why, because Ezekiel is not that book that that everybody is like, oh yeah, I was reading in the book of Ezekiel yesterday too. It's not, not that only kind on of the book. yearly Bible plan. Do I open that yeah. one up? <laughs> exactly. I don't remember why I was reading in that book, but I was, and I came to Ezekiel 36, 26, which says that in, in a nutshell says that God is the one that changes the heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And when I read that, it was as if a light bulb went off in my, in my heart. And I realized that I only had so much control over whether or not my boys chose to follow Christ and the kind of men that they would become. I have a good deal of influence, but I only have so much control. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what that did was begin this organic conversation in my heart between me and the Lord. And I began praying, Lord, would you change their hearts of stone to hearts of flesh? And without even realizing what I was doing, I started praying God's word back to him. And now there were two things that I knew to be true in that season. One was that, well, really three, one, I believed that God's word itself was true. Mm -hmm. And the next one was that I believed Hebrews 412, which says that God's word is living and active. Mm -hmm. In other words, it has the power to change us from the inside out. It's not like any other book that we might read. It is powerful and living and active. I believed Mm -hmm. that that was true. I also believed Isaiah 55, 11, which says that God's word will not return void. In other words, it will do exactly what he purposes for it to do. So all of this stuff was happening in my heart and in my mind at the same time. And I decided that I couldn't think, you know, if that was true, I couldn't think of anything better to pray for my kids 
than God's word itself. Mm -hmm. And I just got hooked on it. Before I knew what happened, I was looking at God's word, trying to find things to pray for them. I began to make a list of things that I wanted God to accomplish in their lives. And then I would go to the word and say, Lord, what can I pray into this? Not taking it out of context at all, trying very Mm -hmm. hard, in fact, to keep it in context, but just looking at at God's word and saying, how can I pray this for my children? How can Mm -hmm. I ask God's word to be living and active in them? How can I ask you God to be true to your word so that it won't return void in them? And I just got hooked on it. And what Mm -hmm. happened, Lana, is that in the beginning, when I first started having my children and realizing how inadequate I was and and how little control I had, um, I felt like a bad mom. I felt like I, I, don't have it all together. I've been able to Mm -hmm. accomplish all these things, all these things that I wanted to, but I can't do this. And as I poured myself into God's word and into praying God's word over my children, what began to happen is that God did Hebrews 412 in me. Mm -hmm. God did Hebrews 5511 in me. And Mm -hmm. now 18 years later, I am much more, not perfect, never perfect, but much more like the mom that I wanted to be back then. And so Mm -hmm. I say that the mission of Million Praying Moms is to get moms praying scripture, and it is, but there's this secret backdoor thing that I really want to have. I know it's going to happen if I can get them into God's word and praying God's word, he's going to do the work of Hebrews 4.12 in them. Mm -hmm. And he's Mm going to do the work of Isaiah 55.11 in them. And I'm, I'm getting, I'm starting them out because they're desperate for God to do a work in their home. But mm-hmm. I'm, I know that God's going to do this sneaky other thing, which is mm-hmm. glorious and amazing. And he's going to make them look more like his son in the process. And that's going to change homes and that's going to change things for eternity. And that's really exciting to me. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So tell me what it looks like practically when you just, I, I'm trying to go through like a day in a mom. So these moms that are coming to you, Um, And we've all been there where, you know, motherhood is one of the absolute hardest things, the best and the hardest thing I think we'll ever do. And we go through these phases where it's ups and downs. And so many times if our kiddos are, um, you know, on the honor roll or doing good or making good choices with friends and doing things right, we feel like a good mom, like you're mentioning. And if, if they don't, we take it personally because we must have done something wrong. So moms are coming to you from these different avenues of depending on how they're feeling, whether the kids are doing good or doing, you know, bad things or whatever. What is the practical first step that you have them? Is it, do you have them schedule it? Do you have a program where you kind of walk them through? Because we're all so busy and, um, You know, I know, and it it took me into my 50s before I realized like what a concept. You know, I had a a miracle within my life and I had a brain tumor and it was prayer, period. That was it. I mean, God was all over it. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be talking, all those things. And I, you know, it's a living miracle and it shouldn't have taken me <laughs> to, I was a good Christian mom, got my kids to church and all the things and did the prayers, but I wasn't living in that and living it out like I should have been. And so I'm so glad of what you're doing and bringing these moms that are quite a bit younger with the kiddos still young in. So tell us a little bit about the program and how, how they practically live that out. Like, on, what does that look like daily? Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, that if you'd like, I have a resource that they can get for free called how to pray God's word for your kids. It's very simple. It's very short. I'd be happy to send you a link to that so that you can include it in the show notes. You can also find it on millionprayingmoms.com. It's a free resource and it will have you praying God's word by this afternoon. It is not rocket science. And I want to, I want to say that up front because there is nothing special about me that, that, that God has opened up the heavens and allowed me to have more time than the average mom, um, more brain space than the average mom. I'm not holier than the average mom. I don't have anything that your listeners don't have as well. If they know Jesus, there's nothing available to me that wasn't, that isn't available to to them. So it is doable and it's perfect for a busy mom. So if they want to grab that, they can't take you step by step how I 
first started doing this in my own life and what it looked like. But but we have resources at Million Praying Moms that help the busy mom in particular, because it is hard sometimes to find time. When I first started praying this way, I uh, would come home and I would, or I would wait for my husband to come home and I would say, honey, I need 30 minutes. Can you give mm-hmm. me 30 minutes in the bedroom? And I would take my Bible and I would take a notebook and I would go upstairs and I would sit down and make a list of, let's say, the character traits uh, of my children that I don't like, for example. Like maybe Mm -hmm. I have one that's prone to anger or maybe I have one that's prone to, you know, um, lying or, or you put you fill in the blank with where your child struggles. And so I'd write all those down and make a list. And then I would try to think of the biblical opposite of those. So if my child has an anger issue, I might want to pray instead for him to have joy, Mm -hmm. right? And so I would look at that and try to figure out what's the biblical opposite of that. And then that's the word that I would take to my concordance and say, what can I find that, that I can pray again, that's not taking Mm -hmm. anything out of context, but that I can pray for my child in this area. And I would write down verses or passages about every character trait that I wrote down. And I would just string Mm -hmm. them into one big, long prayer. And in those days I would type them up, print it out, put it in a frame and hang it outside my children's doors. And every night when we would go in to say goodnight to them or, or to be with them for a few minutes before we went to bed, I would come out and I would lay, literally lay hands on their doors and I would pray those prayers for them. And I did that for years and years and years. And now we have other resources to help you. You don't necessarily have to do it that way. You certainly can. We have all kinds of topical, topical prayer guides and journals that if you have a need that you need to pray for your child in a specific area, kind of already done the work for you. You mm-hmm. can go and, and grab one of these and it will give you what to pray so that you can just look at it and pray God's word back in a way that's already done for you, which is not wrong. It's just a mm-hmm. help to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what it looked like for me in early years. Today, it tends to be <clears throat> a little bit similar, but not exactly the same. Normally, I take one of our prayer journals or our prayer guides, and I'm, you know, I'm using them in my own life. I'm not just making them and pushing them out. I'm actually using them in my own life. So I've just gotten through praying uh, for my child to find his purpose, which is one of our prayer guides, uh, mm-hmm. because I, he just graduated from high school and he's getting ready to go to college. It's a perfect thing for, for me to be praying for him. Um, and I'm in the midst of praying through our latest prayer journal, which is everyday praise prayers for patients, um, because I need all of that that I can get. So, mm-hmm. and I want to be able to extend it to my children as well. So I just, I've always just picked topics that were real and true and where mm-hmm. I needed God's hand to show up either in my life or in the lives of my loved ones. And I've, I've looked to his word to help shape how I can pray that. Mm, that's wonderful. And we will definitely add those resources to the show notes because um, that's powerful. And if you're praying the word, that is that is powerful. And God, God hears that. And I love that you were doing that at bedtime you know, as you put them to bed, uh, that's just, that's beautiful, beautiful. So as our kiddos, we had just chatted a little bit about um, kiddos going back to school. And I know you have some, some things going on with that. As they're heading back to school, you know, that looks different depending on ages. I have, you know, my my youngest daughter is still in college, so she's going to be heading back to school. Uh, some of the younger moms have, um, you know, homeschooling or they might be getting on a bus. But in the next couple of weeks, things are going to shift and uh, all the, the structure is going to come back and all of those types of things. Do you have any tips for those moms of school age kiddos, whether it's, you know, kindergarten all the way up through college as we head into this next school year? Do you have any tips for the moms outside of praying? Because we talked about the praying and we know, (laughs) you know, we know that that so uh, that's that's the given one here. Well, let me, let me add something to that because yes, we need to be praying for them, but I want to give you a little bit of a reason why and a, and a tip that can help you do it in a really personal way. One Mm -hmm. is that 
you are going to feel at some point, whether it's today or tomorrow or two weeks from now, you're going to feel out of control. You're Mm -hmm. going to feel like uh, something is happening to your baby, whether your baby is five or 18 or 25, doesn't matter whether they're Mm -hmm. 45, you're going to feel like something is happening to them that you can't control or that you can't fix. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason that we pray is because we can go to the God who can fix it, who is in control, who does know what the next day holds, what the future holds. And so if you're feeling out of control right now, if you're feeling overwhelmed, I want you to learn to train yourself. It's just a matter of training. It's just a matter of mind. My dad used to say when I would get really upset, Brooke, it's mind over matter, mind over matter. And in some ways, this is true. It's one of those putting off and putting on kind of things. If mm-hmm. you, if we allow our overwhelm and our, our stress, we it's, it's common. Let me say it that way. It's common for us to allow our overwhelm and our stress to keep us from prayer, to keep us from going to God, because we just feel like we're too busy. I don't have time. I have to fix it. I don't need to pray. I need to fix it. Right. That's how we feel as moms, Mm -hmm. because we all want to control. We all want to protect our children. But if we will instead allow those feelings of overwhelm and stress to compel us toward God in prayer, it will make all the difference. So next time you feel overwhelmed or stressed out, or like you're out of control, Don't refuse to allow that to take you away from God and instead choose to propel it, to to allow it to propel you toward him instead. And I think you'll begin to see a huge difference in how that impacts your emotions, how it impacts your ability to trust him and to have patience with what he's doing in your child's life. So that's number one, Um, a, a tip that's associated to that, that I have loved to do over the years, especially if your kids are going to school outside of your home. But even if they're not, you can still find ways to do this. Go pray in their room. Mm. When we, when we first took our, our first child to high school, there were some things that happened for him that, that at times, and this is not a commentary on the public school system. So don't take it that way. But Mm. there were times when I felt like I was dropping him off in the lion's den. There were some really hard things that happened to him his first year of high school. And I would go drop him off and I would come back home and lay on his bed and cry out to the Lord. And there is just nothing like sitting or laying down or whatever you need to do in your child's personal space and crying out to them on behalf, you know, on behalf of them to the Lord. So do that, try that and Mm -hmm. see how it doesn't connect you to the heart of God for them. Um, Another thing that I would recommend, and this has been something that my husband and I have tried to make a priority, is just to find ways to be there. Find ways to be there. Be there Mm -hmm. for the games. Be there for the moments. Uh, Your children need to know that they are important to you. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, my husband works shift work and always has, has always worked shift work the entire entirety of our children's lives. And he has done his very best to try and and be there anyways. And there have been times when he just wasn't able to, and our kids understand that. But when he is there, he's all there. They know he's going to be there. They know that that he's supporting them. And that has been, as I look back, having just graduated one, that is one of the things that I cherish the most is that we were there. And it Mm -hmm. wasn't just that we were there for their events. We were there when they needed us. We Mm -hmm. were there to talk when they wanted to talk. We were there to help them process the things that they were dealing with in their lives. We didn't skip over that or try to, you know, just let it go. We actually tried to sit down with them and help them to see what was happening to them through the lens of scripture. This is Mm -hmm. what God says about what you're going through. This is what God's word says about how you should react here. So being a present parent is super, super important. So find ways to be there. Um, And then lastly, I would just say, plan ahead for the things that you that, that you might need. Um, there can be lots of things that change as your children get older. Try to learn about what you think they might need so that you can be ready for it. As a parent, I think sometimes we, we feel like we have to have all the answers. And really, all we have to do is stay about a step ahead of them. Even in our maturity level as believers, All we have to do is be a couple levels ahead of them in order to be able to speak into what they're going through. So if you have a mom, if we have a mom that's listening right now and she says, well, I'm not a very mature Christian. Maybe I just came to Christ. Maybe. Well, that's fine. If you don't know the answers 
that your children are wanting to bring to you, tell them you don't know, and then go figure it out. You mm -hmm. don't have to have all the answers. You just have to know where to go to get them. So plan ahead for those things and know what you're going to do when your children come to you with certain things. That's how I always tried to plan for the new year. It wasn't perfect. We never did it perfectly, but those things really helped create a, uh, a rhythm for us that made it easier to handle whatever came our way. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love how you talked about kind of your evening routine mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just how important it was connecting with them each night. If there was something they, you know, wanted to get off their chest or whatever. And, you know, I would say the same, our, our big time was in the mornings where mm -hmm. it was, you know, no phones, no TV news on it's, you know, we would do a little, it, it literally was two minutes of a devotion mm -hmm. uh, in the morning. They weren't even listening to me. I'm just reading from it while they're shoveling in their, their breakfast. And I'm sitting there thinking that's such a waste of time. And yet later in the day, sometimes something would come up with one of their friends or they were struggling with something. And what I was reading to them came back around in a conversation hours literally sometimes 10 hours 12 hours sometimes later in the week and i just think you know those mornings with the kiddos if you can send them out the door you know peaceful happy joyful and confident in christ you know there's nothing like it because i agree with you when you said you're putting them on you know the bus or dropping them off at at the door it is a war zone sometimes and all of our schools look so differently now and a lot of people are homeschooling um, but it still can be chaos. It can mm -hmm. still be chaos. And so um, I just think that's, those are such good tips. I love, I love that. I love that. One thing, one thing I'll share that really relates to what you just said in the mornings, we did something similar. We would take uh, just a few minutes at the breakfast table and go over. Sometimes I would just read a proverb of the day or a Psalm of the day or something like that. If my husband was here, Again, he worked shift work, so sometimes he wasn't, but if he was here, then he would participate in it as well. When I was still driving my kids to school, they're old enough now that I'm not doing that anymore, but when when I did, uh, we would take, Million Praying Moms uh, has for years created prayer calendars, and so we would take that prayer calendar and I would read the scripture that it was based on for that day, the scripture or passage. If they didn't understand it, then I would give them a quick, we live five minutes from the high school. So this was very quick. I would mm -hmm. help them understand it. And then we would talk about how it applies to their life. How is, you know, how is this something that, that applies to you? And then as we were in the car line, the last thing they heard was mom praying that verse for them or praying mm -hmm. that passage for them as they left for the day. And that was extremely important to me now because they drive I do it all at the kitchen table, but mm -hmm. don't underestimate. It took five minutes. It was five minutes. And my, my youngest son came to me the other day and he said, mom, I think I'm going to sleep in a little bit this year for school. And I said, no, you're not <laughs> because <laughs> this is our time. This is right. when I'm doing this and we're going, we're all going to be at the table when this happens. So protect it and, yes. and get God's word into them somehow, even if it's just five minutes. Yeah. And it is, it's hard to do because we're all, we always have a phone in our hand or there's, you know, news on that we're wanting to see what's going on in the world and all that type of thing. But you said it, you have to protect that time or it's, it's going to be gone and out the door, or you don't, you definitely don't want to be sitting there scrolling on social media during these few moments, because then all of a sudden, you know, they're off at college and not that your time with them is done because they're still, you know, my, I have three that are out of the house and, um, doing good and well, and they come back and we chat and, uh, you know, they still ask our advice, but it's definitely different. Um, we don't have that day to day, like, like we used to. And so the time is short that you're with them. And I, you know, I think that's so wise what you say, just protect that time. Definitely, definitely. So how can we, you know, talking about the same day deliveries and the phones in our hands and all the instant gratification and on demand, you know, we get an Amazon package here same day by four o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. For moms that are praying for their kiddos and um, specifically if, 
somewhat one of their kiddos is really struggling and they're being rebellious or they're not going down the right path that they want them to, that they feel is the godly path for them. If, if you are not seeing those, I hear, I have several friends that are going through situations and they're just not seeing God show up and they're starting not to lose their faith, but start just getting discouraged with that. Do you have any suggestions for those that are continuing to pray and they just feel like they're just tired of waiting on God? And I think that ties in, you know, I didn't even realize that, but the patience piece, um, you know, of what your next book is about, uh, it's hard to have patience. So, you know, speak a little bit to that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm not going to claim that I came up with this um, and I'm trying, I can't remember who told it to me right now, but somebody, I interviewed someone myself one time who was talking about prodigals or children who have walked away from their faith. Um, you know what? It might've been Jill Savage. So I'll give her the the credit there. But one of the things that she said in that situation was to celebrate the little things. So we, when we're praying for something, not just in our children's lives, but even for a loved one or a friend or, or someone we don't even know when we're praying for someone who is not walking toward the Lord or doesn't seem to be walking with the Lord, or maybe he's even seeming to be walking away from the Lord. We keep praying, God, we want to see a miraculous turnaround. We want to see, uh, we want to see you change this person's life. We want to see a big thing. And sometimes God does that. But I think more often what he does is give us a collection of little things that turn the ship Mm -hmm. little by little by little. And so I think as parents, especially if we have a child that's not walking with the Lord, um, we got to look for those little things like, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe your child is, you know, has someone on their baseball team who's a a believer. Okay. So maybe God gave them some kind of influence. Um, Maybe your child made a choice that was positive that, you know, even though they may not know in in the moment, they may not be connecting it, but you know, it was related to one of those moments over breakfast that you all had when you went Mm -hmm. through, you know, God's word, or when you were talking about the wisdom of the Proverbs or whatever, maybe there's little things like that. They made a positive choice instead of a negative choice celebrate that. Say, thank you, Lord, for that. Make a list of those things. Because what tends to happen is when we look for the good, we see it. But when we're hurting, when we're really hurting and devastated, it's hard to see the good. It's easy Mm -hmm. to see the bad. It's Mm -hmm. always easy to see the bad, but it's harder to see the good. So we have to look for it. That would be Mm -hmm. the number one thing that I would Mm -hmm. encourage parents in that season or in that that situation to do. But the other thing is not necessarily something you can do. It's just something I think we need to understand. And that is that God did not promise to give us what we want. God is building his kingdom, not our kingdom. And he uses us to help do that. But his kingdom, as Elizabeth Elliot said, is way bigger than just us and our children. Mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that God did not say, I'm going to give you everything you want, but but he did say he would give us more of himself Mm -hmm. and there's always more of him to get. Mm -hmm. You will never get to a point, no matter how hard things are, no matter how many mountains you overcome, no matter how many victories you see, you will never have all of God that there is to have. And those Mm -hmm. moments when things are really hard. That's what God promises you. I'm going to give you more of me if you'll take it. And that's a treasured gift. I don't look back on the hard things of my life and necessarily wish that they had happened. I might look back on things and say, I wish that hadn't happened the way that it did. But I don't regret the more of God that he gave me as I walked through them. So that's what I would ask them to focus on. What Mm -hmm. What does God want to teach you about himself? How can you get more of him so that your relationship with him grows. And that's not something you'll ever regret. Right. And that's so, so profound. I hope, you know, if anyone comes out of this, I hope they hear what you just said. You know, God uses those tough times and he will bring you closer and them closer. He uses even the very rotten things in life to use to plan out his purposes for us. I mean, and I'm the same way. I look at um, 
all the tough stuff. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade my health scare. I am more in love with God. I can't get enough of him. I wish I had every day just to sit there with my Bible and not do work or anything just to, you know, spend my time with him. I can't get enough. And I wouldn't feel like that. I'd still be doing all the things and going through the motions and being the good Christian mom, but it changed me to my core. And I, even down to sports kids that we were talking about, I look back. So now my three boys are, you know, out of high school and they're, they're out of college and in their jobs and doing, doing well. And I look back at some of those pivotal times with each one of the boys that they had a really rough season or um, they had an injury and they were getting ready to go to state and then something happened or, you know, something didn't work out and it seemed so devastating at the time. And I look at that, those situations now and those that created the character in them, they, I wouldn't trade that for anything. It'd be better than going to state and getting a first place and all the things that were supposed to happen those moments really created in them who they are they became men at those moments and you wouldn't trade it and i think god uses that in our faith walk all the time when when things are not going right he's he's in it like you know romans 8 28 he works Mm -hmm. all things for good and we don't like it (laughs) we don't like it in the (laughs) middle of it for sure um but he definitely uses those things definitely so i know before we were uh before we started recording here we had a a little conversation about um some changes that come up and how um you know you're you're working with one of your children and things have changed and you know as moms that like to uh be in control and plan things out and everything works exactly how we want it um god sometimes shakes some things up so i would love if you if you're comfortable sharing the story about how you know god's just working in your life and in your kids lives right now yeah absolutely so we're a baseball family we love baseball my my husband uh, was a baseball player i ironically didn't know anything about baseball until we started dating my family all played football so i've learned a lot over the years, but my boys both love it. And it's always been my oldest son's dream to play baseball in college. Now, what you need to know about him is that he was kind of a late bloomer and he, he knows I share this story publicly, but, um, he was a little bit of a late bloomer. And so until physically, and so until about his midway through his junior year of high school, we were really unsure if that dream was just going to, you know, materialize or not. We had no We just didn't know. And so he, in the middle of his junior year, started growing like a mad person and he got bigger, stronger, and, and he already knew the game really well. He had a high baseball IQ, but for the longest time, his body didn't, didn't match up with his, um, his IQ for baseball. And so he started having this great high school season. He had a great summer in between his junior and senior year, a really good, strong senior year. And somewhere around his beginning of his senior year, um, he was approached by a local school to play ball for them. And so we were like, yes, this is fantastic. Not only is he going to get to accomplish his dream, but he, it also had the the program, the academic program. This is a, this is a freebie I'm going to give you for us, for any sports parents who are listening. We needed to find the right fit of academics. Uh, we needed to find the right fit of athletics, and we needed to find the right fit of financials. Mm-hmm. So, if a school that cost eighty thousand dollars a year had showed interest in him, then one part of that equation would not have fit, and we mm-hmm. would have said no. So, this particular school fit the fit the paradigm, fit the equation that we needed, and so we were thrilled. Mm-hmm. He went away. Uh, that he graduated from high school. He went to North Carolina for the summer and played in a collegiate baseball league. And somewhere between the Fourth of July, which was just a few weeks ago now, he calls me and he says, "Mom, I've got this other opportunity. I think that I need to go in a different direction instead of going to school where I was going to go. I really think this is where I'm supposed to go." Well, as you might imagine, that kind of turned everything upside down in our world. Um, not only did we, we had not applied to that school. We didn't really know that much about that school. Our, our FAFSA had not included, like our financial aid had not included all that. 
I was stressed out. And I think it was complicated by the fact that he wasn't here. He was in Mm -hmm. another state and it wasn't, he was playing baseball every day, traveling on the right. It was difficult for us to communicate over certain things. And it was a season where I just really, a friend of mine challenged me and I think she was right. She said, Brooke, you need to just say, God, what are you up to? What are you up to? And so that's what I kept saying, God, what are you up to? What are you up to? And so in, in this, this entire season of transition between high school and college, we are now just a few days away from starting school, going in a completely different direction. And the Lord has really uh, opened that door in a way that we were sure it was him. But one of the things that I told you before we got started is that I had, I had an experience like that of myself. Um, when I was finishing up my degree at Virginia Tech, I wanted to go into counseling. And so I thought at that time, I wanted to go into Christian counseling. So I thought at the time that that meant I needed to go to seminary. So I applied for a seminary to get my master's degree. And my parents and I went down there and we visited. And I knew when I got there that it was not the right place for me to go. And I'm not in any way trying to say that it was not a good seminary. I'm just saying, I knew that that's not where God wanted me to go, but I didn't know where he did want me to go. And so a friend of mine mentioned Liberty University, which was about half the distance, about two hours instead of two and a half, maybe instead of five. And he said, why are you going all the way down there? You can just go to Liberty. They've got a great master's degree program in counseling. And so my then boyfriend, now husband, and I drove to Liberty University, spent the day in Lynchburg, and I had exactly the opposite thing happen. The moment I stepped foot on that campus, I knew that's where God wanted me to be. So I had this reservoir of experience and knowledge that says, sometimes God does things last minute and we need to go with it. We need to trust him. We need to, we need to trust that he sees what we can't see. And so walking my son, my oldest through this process of changing direction at the very last minute was this wonderful opportunity, even though it was a little stressful. It was this wonderful opportunity for me to say, look at what God does. We can trust him. We, he sees the bigger picture. We need to look to him to show us where you're going to go. And we can trust that he's going to bring the right people and the right things and the right experiences to the right place for you at the right time. And so it just became this great example of following the Lord. What does that look like? Because, you know, let's face it up until their senior year, our kids have a lot of their decisions made for them, Mm -hmm. but now after graduation, they have much more control and should have much more control over the direction that their life takes. So this was a way for me to say, look what God is doing in your life. And it was just perfect. Even though, again, it was very stressful. It was perfect. Mm, I love that. I love how God just shows up and has a different plan. And more importantly, that you guys have the faith to follow that and not just say, well, this was the plan. I already decided I was going to hear or whatever. And you, you go when you know, when you have those goosebump moments, when you get on that campus, like you did years ago, or, you know, it, your son just knows he needs to go a different direction. We need to listen to that because God does work. And, you know, I think the moral of all of this is God's timing is better than ours. And whether you're yes. sitting there as a mom and you're waiting on that wayward child to turn it around and you're praying and you're praying and you're waiting and you feel like he's not answering or whether he's moving and flipping the switch on something else super quick at the last minute it's god's timing is so much better than ours and it boils down to do we trust him do we believe the creator of this universe loves us and loves our children more than we love them And he has, he does things for their good. And I just, I think that story of what you did just shows, you know, it shows your faith and your trust in God's provision. And I love that you're in sync with your son at the same time going, okay, let's do this. And that's probably because God gave you that same situation years ago. Such a beautiful story. I love it. I love it. So as we wrap up, I know you have a new book coming out that we're excited about. Tell us a little bit about it and where our friends can find that online. Absolutely. The new book is actually a devotional prayer journal, which I love about it. It's 30 days 
um, where we are exploring the idea of biblical patience. And what is patience if it's not just being able to sit back and choose to trust the Lord when we can't understand and can't see everything. That's really what it is. It shows up in our relationships with our children. It shows up in our relationships with our spouses. It shows up in our relationships with other people inside and out of the church, in the community. We are all called on to extend patience and grace to those that are around us. And we all can do that because God has given it to us first. And so inside of Everyday Prayers for Patients, the subtitle is called Giving Yourself and Your Kids the Grace to Grow. Um, We spend the first 15 days really just looking at what patience is. How, because I have found that some people are afraid of it because people have said to me, and I've heard this my whole life as well, don't pray for patience. God will answer (laughs) by testing yours, right? Right. So I have had so many people say that I don't want to book on patience. I'm not praying for patience because I don't want God to test me. Well, first of all, I don't know that like, you're probably going to get tested anyways, whether you pray for it or not, God's going to test you or God's going to, God's going to move in you. He's going to offer challenges. He's going to offer things to grow you, uh, whether we call it a test or not. So I don't know that you have to be afraid of that word, but I think we have a biblical misunderstanding of what patience actually is. And so we fit, we spend the first uh, half of the book, really digging into that and looking at what biblical patience is. And then The last 15 days, we spend some time getting to know the character of God, because I have found that if we don't actually know who God is, we aren't going to be able to trust him. We're just not. So if we don't know, for example, uh, and this is a good one for moms, if we don't know, for example, that God is the one who holds all things together, that's in Colossians, then we're going to mistakenly think that we have to. And we're going to carry burdens that he doesn't expect or want us to carry by himself. If we don't believe that God is good all the time, then we might see the circumstances that he allows into our lives as proof that he's not good. And we might mistrust him because of that. We have to know who God is before we can trust him, before we can have patience. And so that's how the book is set up. And I really and truly believe that if you walk through this, if you engage God with his in his word, if you're praying it back to him, like we do in the book, you're going to come out on the other side, a different person. I don't believe you're going to be perfectly patient. So I'm not Mm -hmm. promising patience in 30 days, but what Mm -hmm. I'm promising is that you'll have a deeper understanding of what it is and who God is. And that will allow you to take the next step in that journey and become more patient. Mm. That's good. That's good. Sounds like a great one. Great one. So has it launched yet? Or are you coming up on the line? What is your launch date? So it is August the 8th. Okay. Okay. And this will probably air around that time. So that's good. Good. Okay. And so where can they find it? You can find it anywhere books are sold. It's available now, or you can just go to millionprayingmoms.com and found, find out all the details there. There's also information uh, on it, about it on my social. So anywhere you love to hang out, you can look for Million Praying Moms and you can find information there. Okay. And so where is on social, what is your favorite place to hang out? Is it Instagram or I love it is. I love Instagram. I'm on Facebook as well at at Million Praying Moms, but Instagram is way more personal for me than Mm -hmm. Facebook or print Pinterest or anything like that. I, I like to show some uh, you know, things about my daily life there as well. And just, you know, you asked earlier about that practical application. So I I share a lot more of what that looks like in my personal life on Instagram than I do in other places. Wonderful. Well, we will add all of that to the show notes. So in case someone is not, if they're driving or walking on a trail and they don't have a pen right now, we'll have it in the show notes, the links in there. So you can click on those. Well, Brooke, thank you so much for coming on. You are a wealth of knowledge um, and I'm excited for your resources for our audience here to get a hold of some of those resources and really, you know, up their game with God. Pressing into him is the answer for everything. And that is exactly what your organization and what your platforms are doing. And I love it. So um, thank you for coming on. It's been a blessing to all of us. Thank you so much.